Okay, I've really been looking forward to this podcast. You know, if you're a fan of the podcast or a fan of Personal Edge, you know my mantra. And that is that the ridiculous concept of time passing on a calendar is an absolute lie. And if you approach a patient or approach a client and you have that ingrained in your brain that time causes deterioration, well, you're not going to help that client or patient as much as you could if you understood the cornerstone of that, which is the body has an ability to do what no other machine can do, and that is it has the ability to heal itself. Well, did you know there is a study of medicine that is dedicated to that particular same cornerstone? And it's been around since the 1800s. We're talking today to Dr. Paul Langevin, a Star Valley osteopathy about osteopathic medicine, today on the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast. Welcome to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast with Garrett Williamson. Health, wellness, exercise, nutrition, and a whole lot more. Got questions? Call us and leave a message at 251-278-EDGE or message us at Personal Edge Fitness on Facebook and Instagram at Team PE on Twitter or PersonalEdgeFitness.com. Good day and welcome to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Williamson, president of Personal Edge Fitness. Thank you so much for tuning in and checking out this podcast on osteopathic medicine with my guest who I'll introduce in just a minute. But I want to tell you how to get in touch with the show if you have any questions about this podcast or any others. Or if you have any questions for Katie, we have that segment coming up in a couple of weeks. So if you have any more questions for Katie, please submit them to us. And as always, if you just have questions about dispelling myths of health, fitness, and wellness, please contact me at Code 251 278 That's 251 278 Edge. You can also reach out to me at Garrett, G A R R E T T, at personaledgefitness.com, which of course is my email address. It's also our website, personaledgefitness.com, and our Facebook page. Hit me up on Twitter at, at Team PE if you're so inclined. Looking forward to getting into this topic because it's something that most people don't know very much about. I know enough about it to be dangerous, which is why I have an expert with me today, and that is Dr. Paul Langevin of two clinics, actually, the Osteopathy Clinic, both in Star Valley, Wyoming, and also one in Jackson Hole. Dr. Langevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being on with us to clear up a lot of confusion <laughs> about osteopathic medicine. First, tell us a little about yourself. You have a very interesting background. It is a little convoluted, and I, even as a physician, I don't have a uh, standard background uh, where to begin. It's a uh, really loaded question. So after high school, I went straight in the Navy. I was enlisted in the Navy for four years, right. and I did that for four years. I was on a destroyer out of San Diego. This is back in the 80s. And then I got out and did construction for a bit. Uh, a summer of roofing in Maine convinced me I needed to start college. <laughs> and so, uh, I understand that would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People don't realize Maine is actually quite humid and hot. So um, after that, I started college and then transferred to Oklahoma because New England is very expensive and Oklahoma was a lot more reasonable. My brother was living there at the time. And then my now wife was my girlfriend back then. And I was working as a chemist for a bit. And somebody told me to take the MCATs and I barely knew what the MCATs were for, so I took the MCATs, scored very well, and I had no plans of going into medicine. And then when I realized it was 150 or $200 just to apply to a medical school, I was like, well, I'm, I'm not going to apply to – I'm just going to apply to one and see what happens. Right. So uh, OU, University of Oklahoma, had the MD school. Oklahoma State University had the DO school. Right. And so well, what's a DO? And so I read up a little bit on a DO. They do medicine. They can get into any specialty, but they also do this manipulation. I'm like, wow, that sounds cool. I'd right. never been to a DO, knew nothing about it. So I just applied to that one because I didn't want to spend money to apply to two schools. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> and so I applied to it, got in, and a little unknown fact is uh, I never finished my undergrad. So I don't have an undergraduate degree. I just I got accepted to the school. <laughs> and so I, so at the time, I had a high school diploma and a medical degree. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> Interesting uh, combination. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because back then, you didn't really need it. My scores were very high. They just, again, I called them up when I got my acceptance letter. Hey, like, hey, I have another year of undergrad. And they're like, well, we accepted you. We don't care what you do. <laughs> okay. So since I was kind of frugal, well, Jen was frugal. I right. wasn't frugal. Right. But uh, Jen, my wife, yes. went ahead and applied for a Navy scholarship. So that took it, you back uh, into the military then? It I mean, took me back to the military, yes. Okay. Yeah, it did. So I did the DO school thing. And then after you graduate, you take the oath and you're an officer. Right. And then I went off to Camp Pendleton mm -hmm. Naval Hospital and I did an internship. And I didn't want to continue residency right away since I was in the Navy. I wanted to go do something really cool. So I was a flight surgeon. Oh, and awesome. So that's, that's a six-month training in Pensacola. Right. And then you get assigned to a, a, a squadron. 
Okay. We had the arduous duty of being a flight surgeon for helicopter squadron in Sicily, Italy. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, you're just not going to get these opportunities anywhere else. <laughs> no, that's true. I did that time, did my payback for my scholarship uh, while I was at the squadron, and then we got out and moved to Wyoming right. to finish training and then just live life. And I was an ER doctor for five, six years, okay. something like that. Yeah. And I just traveled around the state working in various ERs. Right. And then kind of got bored, bored with that. So we went back in the Navy in 2011. We were living in Casper, Wyoming. We sold that house and we bought a house in Star Valley, Wyoming. It's a little slice of heaven in western Wyoming on the Idaho border. Know it well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went to Hawaii. I was with Marine Infantry for three and a half years. <laughs> Italy, Hawaii. Yeah, you did a little bit yeah, of traveling yeah. here. And then I went back to training in Pensacola, but... I was stationed in Pensacola, but Jen wanted to go to nursing school, so she went to USA in Mobile, and so right. we lived in Fairhope, yeah. which is our little slice of heaven down south. Right. Fairhope is just such a great place. <laughs> so I did three years in Pensacola doing training in aerospace medicine and occupational medicine. Then I got assigned as the senior medical officer on board the USS Nimitz. Wow. And, what type of ship um, is that? that? I know I know the Nimitz, but I'm not sure the classification. It's an aircraft carrier. It's the first of its kind. It's a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. And all aircraft carriers, except for the Ford class, are, are based off the USS Nimitz. Okay. And I did that for three years. It was normally a two-year job, but I, I extended for a year. Mm. Then I transferred to Whidbey Island, and I was what's called a, well, I was a senior regional flight surgeon, meaning that for the entire Pacific Northwest, if there's a flight surgery issue or things that need to be taken care of, I took care of them. And I was up on Whidbey Island, and we have two wings up there. One is the F-18 Growler Squadrons. They're the electronic attack. And then the P-8s, they are the maritime patrol. They they hunt submarines from 737s. Oh, wow. Amazing. Amazing. And I had 14, 14, 15 flight surgeons that worked for me. Man. And they were, and they were all over the world. They were, you know, they were deployed. One was in Germany. They could be in Sicily. I mean, they're all over the world and right. kind of manage those. Right. Try to hurt those kittens. So last year I retired from the Navy. I got a promotion, but I, I felt my time in the Navy was done. So I turned down the promotion, put in my papers, retired. We moved back to Star Valley and I opened my practices in November. End of what you just told me about your military career, which is impeccable. And I'm sure you get this because I know, you, especially in Wyoming, you're loaded with patriots out there. But I'm going to add to it. And that is, as always, thank you very much for your service. We greatly appreciate it. But usually at the end of, of that long a description, it and, and then I retired. And, th and that's it. That's, that's the end of it. But you started <laughs> basically a second career. And, and before I go on, I want to point out that uh, there's something I did not know. I did not know you were a flight surgeon. And that's something near and dear to my heart. My father was a flight surgeon. Now, he was in Air Force, oh, okay. but, but he was yeah. a flight surgeon and extremely proud of it to a day of his passing. So you started really a, a second career, which is something actually you'd been you know, practicing, obviously. You went to school for this, and this is something I want you to tell us a little bit about, and that is that what is osteopathic medicine? DOs are fully licensed physicians like MDs. We can get into any specialty. We can do surgery. We prescribe medications. A lot of people don't know about DOs because we are a minority. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but in in the civilian population, we make up about five, six, maybe seven percent of the physician population. Wow. It's a four year medical school. Right. Like MDs. Right. And in the military, DOs make up about fifteen percent. Okay. So we make up a higher percentage in the military. And that's that's uh, that's a post Vietnam phenomenon. Phenomenon. Yeah. And after Vietnam, the military just hemorrhaged physicians. People were leaving left and right as wow. quickly as possible. So they needed to refill those ranks. Right. And so for many years DOs were looking for full licensure, full ability to practice sure. medicine. And I can't remember the year, I think it was seventy five or seventy six that the DOD allowed DOs to become physicians. And so they kind of filled that vacuum that was right. created from Vietnam. Right. And so that's where we're a higher percentage of physicians in the military than the civilian. Sure. The way you approach medicine, to me, seems drastically different or very different than an MD would approach it. Am I, am I right about that or am I making the wrong generalization? Um, the training is different. Okay. Osteopathic medicine was developed by a Civil War physician, Andrew Taylor Still. He was out of Missouri right. and he was an MD. Okay. After the war, he relocated back home to Missouri right. and his wife and four or five of his seven or nine children, I don't know the exact numbers here, died of cholera one year. 
Wow. And so being a physician, he was like, if my family is dying, then everybody else's family is even worse. Yeah, definitely. So he started thinking about how they're doing medicine. Remember, this is the 1860s and 70s. Right. So okay. amputation, arsenic, bloodletting, you know, right. yeah. uh, opium, yeah. opium yeah. for a cough. So... <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, we've come so, a long way. <laughs> we, we have come a long way. So he, he really started working on if the body is working appropriately, it should heal itself. And so he found that people that are sick had some physical manifestation of that sickness, whether it's through the musculoskeletal system, the fascia, the nervous system. And he felt if you rearrange, not rearrange, but if you correct those abnormalities in the body, it should be able to heal itself better. Right. And so he developed this over a couple decades. And what he really wanted to do was bring this to the ND world and have them start doing it. That is what I see as the cornerstone of osteopathy is the body's ability to heal itself. Yes, it is. It is the it is the second tenet of osteopathic medicine. Yes. Okay. But I knew that was a important factor of it. I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to that in a second because of what we preach and what have you. But I didn't I didn't mean to inter- interrupt there. But and then uh, the MDs soundly rejected him. So he uh, he did what the Clampets did. He packed up everything and moved to Kirksville, Missouri. Right. He started his own school. Okay. So it was the American School, American College of Osteopathic Medicine. Interesting. And it opened its doors, I believe, in 1892. Wow. So this is body work and medicine. And he had a hospital there. They called them sanatoriums back then. Right. And so he had medical students. And usually were small classes, 10, 12 people. What people don't understand is that this predates chiropractors. Palmer did not report his, and that's the guy that founded uh, chiropractic. Right. Palmer didn't report his first working on somebody until 1895. Oh, wow. And still had been working out this osteopathic thing that he's been, that was kind of um, an obsession. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, I understand that. So uh, he'd been working at, on this since uh, the late 1860s, 1870s. Right. So, yeah. You don't want to get too deep into this, but I know that Dr. Still originally wanted to go and approach the MDs about it, and they, they clearly rejected it. And I know there's, there's been some friction there, but fast forward to 2023. This is a vastly different environment now. I mean, you're saying more and more DOs in this area that are affiliated with hospitals. It's becoming much more, I, I won't say accepted, I'm going to say understood uh, practice as far as that goes. So, But I want to go back to, if you don't mind, go back to this, this second tenet. And the yep. reason I find that so important is it's something we talk about all the time. I, I, I talk about the fact that the body is the most um, amazing machine you will ever encounter. And I'm curious if you agree with this. I, I'd say that we've been studying it. I always say we've been studying it since the uh, late 1500s because I think that was the first actual autopsy. And we still don't know everything about it. Am I right about that? Oh, yes. I, I think we're still scratching the surface. But exactly. And it's so complex and so wondrous. Very much I, think, so. I don't want to downgrade what NDs and DOs have done. You know, we've oh, done no, some no, amazing not by things. any means. We open up the chest, we put, take out one heart, we put in another. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's yeah. just phenomenal. But we're dealing with but, the machine. It's the only machine that I know of, unless you can think of something. I mean, you've been around a lot bigger machines than I have. But it's the only, the only machine that I know of that has the ability to repair itself. What do I do for a living? I t- tell this all the time on the podcast. I, I tear muscle fiber. I mean, that's what I do. People come in here and pay me because they want me to tear mm-hmm. their muscle fiber. Because I'm, yeah. I'm telling the body basically wrong, do it again. And the body rebuilds it, makes it stronger. That's the only machine I know that has the ability to, even with AI out there, it's the only machine I know that has the ability to do that. Am I correct? No, you're absolutely correct. And this is one of the things that really has become very ingrained in people's psyche is, well, I have a lot of wear and tear. No, you don't have a lot of wear and tear. Your right. body can correct itself. Period. You've been doing something wrong for a long time, and that hurts. Bingo. But it can repair itself, and nothing else can do that. Right. Our bodies are designed to do that. Right. So what you see a lot is this myth that, well, if you run, your knees are going to go bad. Your back's going to go bad. <laughs> it's absolute false. Yeah, I agree. I'm sitting here. And, you know, those of you who are watching me on social media, I'm speaking, of course, Dr. Londo on the phone here, and he can't see this at the moment. He'll see this when he sees the podcast. But I'm sitting here throwing my arms up in the air as he says that, that, you know, that people believe that when you run that, that your just knee's going to go bad. That's it. It's almost like you've got a deadline to your running. And I'm, I, it's funny. I just did a podcast recently on this and had the same reaction. That is absolute false. That is not something that happens to you. It's something that we make happen to ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, when I was in medical school, there was this elegant, I mean, just beautifully done study. And it was small. And of course, there's no pharmaceuticals involved. So it's not going to get a lot of attention. But right. it was done in Montreal, Canada. Radiologist, who is an avid runner, wanted to a- answer this question. So right. he took 
healthy runners who have been running at least 20 years. And right. then he took, he age matched, sex matched, and health matched as far as no medical issues, no issues, you know. Right. And he x-rayed their, he x-rayed the controls and the runner's knees. Right. And he found that the runners who had been running 20 plus years had better gapping, less osteoarthritis, and it wasn't a big study. It was a small study. I think there was right. maybe 20 participants, but it, he showed a, s- a statistical significance sure. that there was less knee issues in runners than in their matched controls. Wow. Wow. It was a beautifully done study. I'm small. Sure. And it, was, sure. yeah. it was like a footnote in a, in a, in a journal, but it was beautiful. Right. Well, so, I, and I have to be careful here. And the reason being, because I'll go off, there's some other things I want to talk to you about your practice, but to kind of bring this whole thing to a point, and the reason I'm so excited to hear you say this and talk about this, and this is why, this is why I really like the DO approach. There's a mantra, and my fans of the, of the podcast know that I talk about this all the time. It's pretty well, I, I feel it's the reason I was put on this earth, and that is what I call the lie of age. The ridiculous, absurd idea that we deteriorate simply because time passes on the calendar. I've always argued that there are four different things that actually dictate ability their fitness nutrition lifestyle and the absolute most important which is mindset because if you believe you're going to fail not a whole lot i can do for you and all four of those are 100 percent controllable now whether you fully agree with that or not that remains to be seen but this is what i'm talking about right here we're talking about what you just mentioned a, a minute ago and that is the you know like, like we were talking about runner's knees these things don't happen to us we make them happen to us as i've said age doesn't happen to us we happen to age that's why i think i love the fact that you talked about that study because i think that's exactly what they're proving there oh yes definitely and i completely agree with that concept yeah the concept of sarcopenia age-related yes. muscle loss which yes. you talk about frequently yes is based on 40s 50s 60s 70s concept of aging gracefully right not being active you're right. a grandparent you should just tote around the house do some stuff exactly and wait for your grandchildren to visit you for christmas and that, that's absolute false it's so absurd i mean we start with the notion okay everybody needs to swallow this pill and just believe it next year you're going to be worse off okay everybody believe that there's not one single clinical study on the face of the earth that proves that but everybody just believe yeah. it now let's start from there and see if we can help you <laughs> I think that's yeah, an absurd exactly. way to to approach healing anybody, exactly. no matter what the practice is. But you and I will spend all day on this because I, I know we're of the same mind on it. But what do people come to you for that? What are the big things that you see? I mean, there's some big ideas, there's big concepts that people seek out osteopathic medicine for. And so what do you, what do you see in your practice? Like most, uh, my bread and butter is back pain. Okay. Whether it's low back pain, mid back pain, neck pain, that's, that's going to be the most common one. Sure. Then any kind of like extremity pain, probably the next one would be shoulder and hips would be the big ones joint related stuff yeah and then headaches are huge right. tmj foot pain sure and then we start kind of getting into the smaller stuff like i had one gentleman come in and, and he goes this one thumb <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. okay let's work on this one thumb and he left very happy could he had his grip strength and his thumb didn't hurt anymore when he grabbed stuff. Um, what you're talking about there, first and foremost, is pain. And boy, that gets everybody's yes. attention. It's been said many, many times. I don't know a lot of people agree with this. I don't go to a doctor unless I have a problem. And pain will certainly send you <laughs> to go get help. But that's also yes. that's also got to, I always say that people not only go for pain, they go for limited ability. You know, when their mm-hmm. abilities are limited, that's when they'll typically seek help. I'm sure you see a lot of that. Oh, yes, because people really don't know what I do. And so they're kind of coming in questioning, well, I have this issue. Can you help it? And so I had this one young gentleman come in and he's been having low back pain. Right. He uh, works kind of a physical job at the airport in Jackson. Sure. We took care of his back. I mean, within 10 minutes. Right. He was touching his toes again. He was moving freely. He's like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. And he's an avid rock climber. So he's very, very fit. He likes to work out all winter long just to be in shape to make sure he can go rock climb. Sure. Okay. And so he goes, well, my, sh- my shoulders are a little tight. They're not quite moving right. They don't hurt. And so we worked on his shoulders and his mid back and his neck because it's all connected. Yeah, and of course. He suddenly had this free. So, so it's, it's also performance. Right. Whether it's a, a dance performance, whether it's a physical activity you want to do, skiing, snowboarding, sure. climbing, whatever it is. Right. It also helps um, kind of because when people train specifically for an event, yes, as opposed to just general conditioning, uh, and they're pretty intense with it, they're going to introduce these little micro traumas throughout their system. Sure. Or they may overwork one thing because they don't, they're not doing it appropriately. Right, and, and cause so an imbalance, both. which is going to cause a pain elsewhere. Right. Exactly. Or maybe not even a pain, just, just, okay, well, this aspect of my training 
Okay, because everybody wants to do pull-ups when they climb, right? Right. right. So they tend to overwork one range, but when they need to do chin-ups, they can't, they're not as strong because they've overbalanced one side over the other. So by mo- removing those limitations and kind of helping them correct those exercises, right? Here's the thing that I always tell my patients: the last person you want to talk to, nutrition or exercise, is a physician. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> true. Exactly. I have to agree with you. Physicians get trained in disease surgery, and they're very good at it. And they've they've advanced. I mean, as we talked about, you know, replacing right. a heart in somebody's body. Come right, on. Exactly. In the same breath, the last person you want to talk to about surgery is a personal trainer. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can talk to you about yeah. rehab and afterwards. I can talk to you about doing prehab prior to. I can talk to you about everything physical around it. But don't talk to me about surgery because I'm not trained in surgery. Just like physicians aren't trained in exercise, they aren't trained in nutrition. But on yeah. that note, I've kind of dabbled into something here as far as surgery is concerned. That's where I think a lot of people find that that's got to be the answer. But you say yes. that's not so. No, it's it's not so. Just in my practice alone, I see a lot of people, well, you know, I had my MRI, which yeah, that's a whole different topic by itself. And I'm thinking about going and seeing a spine surgeon. Sure. Okay. Uh, what are you going to see them for? Oh, my back pain. Okay. Spine surgery is to correct neurological compromises within the spine. Right. So... That's not back pain. That is something else. You have numbness tingling going down your legs. You have pain sheeting down your legs. Or the extreme is you have muscle loss. You have dysfunction and uh, loss of like a reflex. Right. Okay. That is an indication for spine surgery. Right. So the surgeon is going to go in there, correct that, and those symptoms will go away. Mm -hmm. But guess what you're going to have after surgery? You're going to have back pain. Right. So that was my story in 2014. I had severe pain in my left leg. My Achilles tendon, you know how they do the little reflex test down there? That was completely absent on the left side. Oh, wow. And then my left calf kind of shriveled up a little bit, and the surgeon went in there, removed a huge piece of disc material that was pressing up against L5-S1. Right. And all the pain went away. The numbness tingling went away. Right. The calf hasn't returned, so my running days are over, and that's when I got into powerlifting, and my back pain was still there. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that people don't understand. Surgery will not take care of that issue that you're complaining of. Right. It's useful if, if there's a hip replacement or a knee replacement most of the time, not all the time. Remember, every this is what I tell my patients. The first doctor that promises you an outcome is the doctor you walk away from. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, Interesting. Yeah. So they're going to try their best, but, you know, not everybody's going to have the same outcome. That's, yeah, sure. that's the thing that people have to look at. Right. And somebody different will say, well, my neighbor gonna respond to differently. Out. I mean, different bodies exactly. respond differently. It's the same thing we tell our, to our clients when they come in about when we, they're coming post a surgery that we've seen before or a particular condition we've seen before. I mean, one of the number one things we see is rotator cuff damage. And they'll come in and tell us mm-hmm. what's wrong with that. They'll tell them and tell us I just came out of an ACL repair. And we'll tell them the same thing. Give us permission to talk to either physician or, or in most cases, their physical therapist. And the reason being, we haven't seen their ACL tear. We haven't seen their ACL repair. It's, it's, it's going to be different. No matter what, something about it is going to be different. You're seeing the same thing. You've got back pain in this area. It's probably on this joint. You've seen it a thousand times before, but you have not seen this one And because everybody's yeah. going to heal different. Everybody's going to present different. Yeah. I'd caution folks, and I've got the same the situation happening right now with the, with the client I'm, that I'm working with. We, we have constant hip pain. We still can't figure out what it is. He's been to a surgeon. He's had x-rays done, what have you. He still can't figure out what it is. And we've done simple evaluations here, and this is why I'm encouraging him to see some like you because there's something going on there we know that for a fact and there's got to be there's got to be an answer and most likely it can be corrected and i'm gonna say this over the phone not saying him yes because i've been doing this for over 26 years right his problem is in his fascia the fascia has some sort of derangement in it right that's causing some sort of abnormal movements sure or dysfunction in it right and that's where his pain is coming from hmm. and i, I, I see this appreciate day you in day that. out Definitely. So, and of course, that's not seeing him, but that's a that's a whole nother route. Actually, I hate to tell you this. I, I've not had him see him on my ATCs. We, we probably would have brought that up, but that's not something I've thought about and something we would definitely will address with him. If, if somebody's wanting to come see you, tell us about where you're located and, and how to get in touch with you. It's very easy. So uh, my practice is not your typical doctor's practice. It's a micro practice. It is literally just me. I don't have staff. Sure. It's me in a, in a one room at both my locations. Right. So Star Valley Osteopathy is in Afton, Wyoming. Okay. It's at uh, 47 Doc Perks Lane. Not that it means anything <laughs> to anybody <laughs> in Mobile. Yeah. I literally have one room that I rent from a physical therapist. Okay. With my table and my other stuff that I do there. Sure. They just visit my website. And on there is book an appointment. You push the button and you're going to see my calendar right you you register you choose what works for you you fill out all your information right 
and then I see you when you come in. So when they come um, in, they actually see you. I mean, that's <laughs> that's fantastic. What 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 most people want is they want when it, especially when they have a problem, they want access to the to to the physician. And so oh, you're yeah, saying there's direct I, I, access. Yeah, I come out, grab them from the waiting room, bring them back. We sit in my room. The first appointment's anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. It's all with me. Sure. We go over your medical history, what's ailing you, right. and it's just hands-on. It's my table. I have some other stuff that are that I could use sure. to help with the manipulation, and it is just one-on-one for, for the entire time. And direct. That's, that's and very, fantastic. Very, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I'm going to make sure that we have, and those of you watching this on social media, you see all the links that we have posted. Of course, with my audio your, uh, podcast, the, the, we have the links there of how to get in touch with uh, with Dr. Longevin. And, and I don't want to offer this without, without asking you first, but if you had somebody that's not near located in your area, would you mind uh, fielding a call or have somebody that okay with somebody reach out to you if they've got a question? I actually do all the time because I do Facebook ads. Oh, and so I'll get somebody from Texas. Hey, I like this. What, what do I have around me? And so I'll kind of help them find what they need to find. But yeah, great. they can go to my website. They can use the contact link, which sends me an email. Sure. Or my cell phone number is on there. Oh, great. Great. Fantastic. This is the first time we've had it on the show. I'm probably going to have you come back on to talk about when we're running through different different conditions and what have you and, and problems that we see. And especially when our listeners contact us about particular issues, would you mind Would you mind coming back on to deal with some of those? Oh, I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Yeah. Fantastic. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you being on the show and I look forward to having you on again. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. There's many ways to approach any problem, especially any physical problem. And there's a, as I've said many times, there's a myriad of health problems professionals out there. When you've got a, a nutrition concern, hey, that's why we have dietitians. When you've got an exercise concern, that's why we have exercise physiologists. When you've got an eye problem, that's why we have ophthalmologists. And this is yet another way of approaching problems in your body, especially working with the fact that the body can heal itself. As you heard Dr. Longevin say, driving that idea down that home about the fact that, you know, we deteriorate ourselves, our, our bodies don't automatically deteriorate. And bringing professionals on to talk to us about that is just one more way we help you live your level of wellness. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast with Garrett Williamson. Subscribe now and be a part of the show by calling 251-278-EDGE or message us on Facebook and Instagram at Personal Edge Fitness or at Team PE on Twitter and visit us at PersonalEdgeFitness.com.